Hello, Rebels. I have something big to share with you today. Uh, you all know my debt story with my dad and the debt he put my family in. If you don't, listen to episode two of season three with Christian Bryce from Millennial Revolution, where they interview me about losing the family home and the debt story. And this debt story has inspired the Rebel Business School, the Rebel Finance School, and me being on a mission to help people make money without going into debt, because debt can have a huge negative effect on people. And we've experienced this through the Rebel Finance School over the last couple of years of running it. We were shocked at one family we helped through it that had a 50% interest rate. Yes, you heard that right. 50% interest rate on some of their loans in an overdraft. That's crazy. Like we worked out if it was set to minimum payments, they would never pay it off. I mean, that's financial slavery and this should not happen. Now, I know people have to take responsibility too. They took that debt on, they bought stuff, and we all have to take responsibility and not take on that debt. But the financial industry, they should bear some of the responsibility too, and it should not happen. So I want to ban advertising of high interest rate. And I'm defining high interest as above 12%. And those of you who know about this stuff know credit cards are averaging 19 to 24 at the moment. So this would affect all of those and all the different companies. I want to ban high interest rate loan advertising because it's just bad for people. It's bad for families. It's bad for us. It's financial slavery. We put cigarettes behind screens. We've stopped cigarettes being advertised because they're bad for your health. Why aren't we doing the same with the finance industry and controlling them, pushing this debt on people? You've got shops that offer credit cards on their desks. You've got pay now, pay later schemes. You've got payday loans. You've got Amazon, who every time you buy something now, offer you their own credit card and they move the no button every time. I mean, this stuff should be illegal. They literally move the no button. So you have to pay attention to what you're doing. Otherwise, they auto sign you up for a 20% something interest credit card. But this is crazy. These companies hire the smartest people in the world to make money out of you. They do this by dressing up debt as finance and pay buy now, pay later and take control of your payments and all these nice terms to make us feel like we're getting a good deal. Whereas actually, they're just putting us into debt and making money out of us. I think they're destroying your financial future and the people who take these loans as financial future. And they should not be allowed to get away with this. They should not be allowed to promote it. So I'm doing something about it. I've started a petition. At the moment, it's only for the UK. But if you're in the UK, you can start a petition for the government. And if you get 10,000 signatures, the government will discuss your proposal. And I have proposed that we ban high interest rate advertising, advertising of high interest rate loans and debt. It's just wrong. And if we get over 100,000 signatures, it will be discussed in the UK Parliament. And they said there's a chance we'll be asked to go up there and talk about it. So if you're in the UK, please will you sign it for me and help me tackle the debt epidemic that's happening. And it's getting even worse in the cost of living crisis that's going on at the moment. All you have to do is go to alandonagan.com forward slash debt. And there is a link to the petition. Petition does not have an easy to remember link. So I've created that page to get you there. Just go to alandonigan.com forward slash debt. If you're in the UK, please help me by signing it now. If you're in the USA, please tell all of your UK ish friends. I don't know what the pure plural is for UK people, um, but please tell anyone in the UK to help us. And we're working to ban the advertising of all loans and debt above 12% plus base rate. This is going to affect most credit card companies and a huge swathe of the financial industry. This predatory lending has to be stopped and it's gotten worse with the cost of living crisis. So please help me make the banks, the finance companies take responsibility for what they're doing. I would love you to help me sign the petition and let's get this heard. Let's get this predatory lending ended. All you need to do is go to alandonagan.com forward slash debt, sign the petition, share it and help me get it out there. And let's stop debt having such a negative effect 
on us. Thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for being a rebel. And thanks for helping me to change the world just a little bit more positively. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur podcast. And this is one of my favorite type of shows. It's a listener just like you who's been listening to the show, listened to some of the podcasts I've done, started something and then emailed asking some questions. So this show is going to be part, how did Matt get going? And the second part, how can we help Matt get further? And by doing this episode, we hope that everyone listening will get some ideas, inspiration and help to unlock them on the next level of your business. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for being part of it. Thank you for having me on. And thank you for replying to my emails as well, which, you know, you don't always get. So that was, it was really cool to uh, get replying and be able to do this. Well, I get a lot of cold emails. I don't reply to them all just Physically, you can't have time to do that all, but yours mm. caught attention, which actually is an interesting starting point. How do you catch attention? Because I get requests all the time to come on the show, and uh, some of them recently have been, Alan, we'd love to come on your show and talk about venture capital, how you can raise money to start <laughs> a business. And I just sit there scratching going, have you even listened to the show? Do you have any idea? But your email, Matt, it started off with, I've come up with a business idea, a Lego pizza oven. You had my interest immediately. <laughs> That's two of my favorite things in the world, Lego and pizza, and you combine them. Then you told me you'd come on the take control of your finances course that Katie and I had run. And mm. it was a lovely email, a lovely email, and it got my attention. So I was going to write back. And I think... If anyone out there is thinking of cold emailing someone, just do your homework and think about how you're going to connect with them. Did you listen to their show? Have you read their blog? What can you talk about? What can you connect on? And then I think what you did really well as well, Matt, was you just had a very direct request at the end saying, do you think this will be fun to be on the podcast? Uh, <laughs> if not, cool, but do you think it'll be fun? And I just thought to myself, yes. It will be fun. Uh, it'll be great. <laughs> yeah. Your email got my attention. Good, good. I I fairly well practice to that from my day job, I think. So I do try and, you know, do a little bit of research beforehand. Yeah, I had put a lot, I, you know, I did spend quite a lot of time drafting that actually. You know, none of it was what I'd call inauthentic. It was all absolutely true and heartfelt. But equally, I did think about the things that I would say and the things that I wouldn't waste your time with. So I thought, yeah, make sure the ask is clear at the very least. And I guess I'd probably use some of your sales advice as well yeah, in terms of writing, <laughs> writing an email to you. So yeah, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, that's like when my wife uses my own tricks against me. She's like, you say this in the podcast and the pop-up business school. And I'm like, oh, don't use my own stuff against me. <laughs> don't hold um, me to my own standards. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Matt, for everyone that's listening... Kind of where were you a year ago? Or where did this all start? Where did all this, the dream of a business, where did this all start for you? Well, I think it goes back to 2016. Um, as it often does for a lot of people, um, I, when I had my first child, or rather my wife did, um, we. <laughs> I'm you, sure you were involved somehow. I, I was, I, you know, I tried my best. Um, and. <laughs> Yeah, I just started to think a bit more about finances and money. I work in the creative industries where um, rates of pay are pretty low, pretty variable, contracts are very tenuous, I'm freelance. And I started to think, oh, hang on a minute, I've got responsibilities now as well, but I don't want to give up this mm. thing that I love doing. Is there a way I can kind of uh, insulate myself a bit from from some of the risks and at the same time kind of be able to carry on doing this thing? Um, so I started to look into personal finance a bit more, which is 
pretty uncool in the creative industries and not a big <laughs> talking point <laughs> traditionally. Um, and I well, just, it's normally a moaning point rather than a talking point. That's uh, absolutely money. true. Yeah. And it's normally statements like, oh, I'm no good with numbers and, you know, I'm, you know, don't talk to me about the cash. I just, you know, paint pictures or whatever. Um, and I Beliefs, found that really frustrating, yeah. you know, and I found that I couldn't find anything that was tailored to my situation yet. You know, even, you know, so much of the kind of financial guidance out there is basically assuming you are on a sort of middling, middling to high income, you, you get a regular paycheck, or it's at the complete other end of the spectrum. It's like you're in crippling debt and you, you're trying to get out of that. So, you know, all those things are necessary, but, you know, freelance careers are growing. The creative industry is like the, the fastest growing sector of the UK economy, or at least it was until recently. Um, and it just felt like, where is the advice for these people? So yeah, I eventually kind of found, uh, the, the financial independence movement and Mr. Money Mustache was my first kind of entry point to that as, as it was for a lot of people, I think. And then later on the choose FI podcast, and that's how I first came across you, Alan, um, on there, uh, back in 2017. So I started to think actually some of these principles, even though they don't, necessarily kind of match my profile in terms of my employment and the the money I earn I thought you know a lot of this is really essential knowledge even you know managing your money just becomes more important the lower your income and the more sort of tenuous your employment situation is so I started to kind of think oh actually I could take some of these principles and even if I'm not going to be retiring at 30 uh, which is unlikely because I turned 30 in 2015 um, so I thought, well, at least I can use some of these ideas to kind of help me sustain myself in creative work a bit longer, um, or, or with a bit more security. Um, so I started to make some pretty big decisions and, you know, talk, well, my wife and I made some big decisions and, you know, start to have some big discussions around this stuff. And eventually we kind of wound up selling our house, uh, moving cities, um, you know, re halving our mortgage payment. Um, wow. And, you know, basically doing all these things that kind of gave us a bit of a cushion and a bit more financial freedom, really, which has translated into a bit more kind of creative freedom and flexibility. So, yeah. So come sort of 2018, after a couple of years of sort of making some of these changes and feeling the effects of it, I start to think, well, maybe someone should be talking about this for people in creative work and seeing if some of these ideas can can work for other people, too. So yeah, so that's really where the kind of the nexus, is nexus the right word? The uh, seed of created mo creative money came to <laughs> came to fruition. Oh my God, so many metaphors. <laughs> but yeah. So what got you off the sidelines was actually having a child. That changed things for you. Is that correct? Is that the, the bit that you went, oh, now I need to make difference. Now I need to make change. Certainly in regards to my personal life. Yeah. I, you know, and, and my, my personal, my, my personal life, my career and how all that fit together, you know, cause creative work is, it's not like a job that you leave at the door, you know, you're doing it all hours of the day. Often you, you know, your personal and professional lives are really intertwined in creative work. Just it's, it's a lifestyle almost for a lot of people. So yeah, so that's when I started to think a lot about that. And then I think in 2018 is when I started to think actually in terms of the business, maybe there's something here in trying to help other people, you know, and maybe I could set something up that helps other people um, and kind of shares some of these ideas and gets them out there and kind of maybe promotes them and, and breaks a bit of the stigma as well of talking about money in the creative industries. So what did actually get you off the sidelines to help you start the business? What changed? What made you start? Because that's that's a fascinating mm. thing. Where did the motivation to get going come from? Because okay. so many people think about businesses for years and never do anything. Yeah. So the when the idea struck me, I did I did the standard thing, I think. I bought the URL and then I sat on it for <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you months, immediately spend years. money. Yep. <laughs> a small a small amount of money, but yeah, I spent money. Um, you know, it, it was it wasn't a lot, but um so I did that and That's actually exactly bought a different, what I did. <laughs> I bought a different URL to the one that I wound up using as well. So arguably com oh. complete waste of money. Um because oh. I was thinking just in terms of musicians at that point, because I, I work as a music journalist, you know, so these are the people I'm talking to a lot. And then yeah, and then basically what happened is uh, bloody great pandemic happened and i thought uh okay 
if it's really time to kind of put up or shut up on this idea because you know if if, if ever people in the creative industries are going to need help with their finances it's now so that's what really gave me the kick and alongside that uh, serendipitously was the launch of rebel entrepreneur which was i think just having that kind of weekly like nudge in the ribs <laughs> was really useful <laughs> it kind of every time i listened to one i was like oh yeah i do need to oh yeah i need to do that and you know just having those kind of hearing those discussions and hearing that kind of just affirmation as well that you you've got to basically start failing quickly <laughs> and then hopefully and then maybe something good will come out of that um i just thought yeah do you know what I've, it's really time to just try and put this out there and see what i can do I love that. Uh, so to everyone listening, this is your weekly nudge in the ribs to get on with it. <laughs> Launch, put it out there, have a go, do it without debt and see where you get to. Um, so Matt, what are you trying to achieve? Where are you going with this? Well, I don't know if it's from listening to the podcast or uh, I'm also, I am also do some lecturing as well. So I think quite a lot about setting goals and outcomes and stuff. So the mission of the site, which I've put kind of front and center on it, is to break the stigma of talking about money in the creative industries and then to share resources and ideas that make creative lifestyles more sustainable. And the final one is to build a support network for kind of creative professionals, hopefully, by doing those things. Um, but I guess really at the hub of all of it, the overarching thing is just to try and make creative lifestyles more sustainable. And it feels like that's more pressing than ever at the moment. Yes, especially as a lot, well, with COVID, we're not having music gigs. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of stuff that has stopped instantly. Cool. So that's what you want to achieve. That's what you want to help. How is this a business or is this just another charity? It's, it's a valid question, Alan. Um, I, think, <laughs> I, I think it is a business. I think, I think that if there's, there's people out there with a problem, what I'm cautious about is that not all of these people have very much money and I don't really want mm. to be taking money off people that don't have very much money. So I quite like the kind of pop-up idea of being able to get sponsorship or support from elsewhere to help me help these groups of people. And yeah, so I think there's a, there's just, I can see quite a few ways that I could potentially make some revenue from it. And it's also something that I don't want to do full time. I want it to be like a part time project of mine because I still really, I, you know, I'm a music journalist. That's a big part of what I, of how I see myself and what I really enjoy doing. I don't want to give that up, but I also, I want to have this kind of something that's a bit more of my own to control on the side. You know, I kind of have like, as a freelancer, you know, you always tell yourself you're your own boss, but really you have about 67 different bosses and then, <laughs> you know so because they're all your clients you know so i think i like the idea of being able to establish something that can kind of become a source of income on its own and that i can sort of run and i can see the result of my own work going into that you know so if i work harder or you know if i do something smart with it i can see that kind of uh bear fruit hopefully um so yeah so in terms of it being a business in terms of how it's a business um do you mean how do i think it might make money well, it's interesting. You probably heard on the show, Matt, I talk about question intonation, mm. where you listen to someone's voice and when they say something, when they're asking a question, they'll raise their tone at the end of the sentence. So even if it is a statement, they might change that statement to a question. Yeah. And when I was listening to you a second ago, you said, well, there's a few ways <laughs> that I think I could make money. Uh, oh. <laughs> and I was definitely, there was some question tone going on there, yeah, uh, sure. which sounds like you've got a few ideas, but we haven't experimented yet. Well, I have, I have made some money off it, I would say. Um, so the thing that I have done, and again, it's entirely down to the kind of nudge in the ribs from Rebel Entrepreneur, but I... I teach, you know, a day a week at a uh, creative college over in Manchester, and I pitch them the idea of running a kind of uh, like a crash course in student money and kind of giving them some fundamentals of personal finance that might actually help them kind of set up in a more sustainable way once they're out of education as well, and hopefully kind of make, avoid some of the mistakes that I made, basically. So I wrote a pitch email about that and sent it to the head of education at the college and he came back really quickly and was like yeah i really love this let's do it for five weeks um Brilliant. so i've been running that 
uh, be two sessions a week on that for the last few weeks. And then again, visions of paper clips and cups and stuff, you know, from yours and Simon's kind of conversations. I, I thought when that was kind of quite a quick, uh, yes on that, I thought, well, maybe this pitch is, is worth trying again. Um, and the college has kind of partner colleges all over the country. It's kind of part of a private chain. Um, so I took it to, yeah, other colleges around the country. So uh, London, Brighton, Birmingham, Bristol, and basically got in touch with the right people, looked up the right people, got in touch with them, used pretty much the identical email and sent it over. And they've all come back saying they want to offer it to their students. So that, Brilliant. that's been amazing. That's really made me think, actually, yeah, this is something that people see the value of and they are willing to pay for it if you find the right person Um, and again you know i like this because the students yes they're paying for their courses but this is offered completely free as an additional option if they want to take it so again it's kind of the college footing the bill and they just appreciate that it's something that might enrich the lives of the students while they're there so yeah so that's working um at the moment but i you know there's other ideas and you know on maybe on the content side i'd like to look at a bit more that i haven't managed to kind of uh, explore very much yet so what are the biggest challenges facing you or where are you going from here that is probably the biggest challenge facing me alan is i don't know where <laughs> i'm going from here um so i i think the biggest the two biggest things are time and focus basically cuz i do the unfortunate nature of the beast in music journalism is you don't get paid very high word rates for the stuff you do. So you have to keep quite a churn on, you know, and you are busy a lot of the time, you know. So Mm. I have to work around that. And, you know, if I want to carry on doing that kind of work, I just kind of have to almost accept that to some extent. There are better paying places I can focus on and so on in my my other work. So, yeah, time's an issue. And I also try to, you know, take on my share of the childcare. And at the moment, you know, during the pandemic, that's a little bit more intensive, than normal so so yeah so time's a bit of a factor at the moment i'm doing about a day a week on the site and related stuff and then focus really is i have probably got about another four ideas beyond what i've already done um about potential kind of revenue streams for it but i'm not really sure which one of those might be the most viable or if i even should be thinking about any of those at the moment given that i've kind of had some success with the student course so yeah well this is actually the key isn't it here before we decide what ideas or what direction you're going, I guess what we need to know is what are the objectives above this? Because we could judge it solely on the mission. We want to further the conversation. We want to get people to talking about money. We want to break the stigma. We want to get creatives talking about it. But there's other factors. There's other things at play, one of which is finances, mm-hmm. another one which is time, mm-hmm. which leads to focus. So. I guess the question is, do you need to make money out of that? Is this a focus? You know, do we need to create cash out of this? Because if you're selling courses to someone, they buy a course and they pay you. If you're building a site that's going to build an audience, a blog, uh, whatever it is, you're going to build a blog, you're going to build an audience. You do that over a long period of time until you've got an audience then you can monetize against the audience. And that's a lot longer term strategy. So one of the questions I always ask at this stage is how quickly do you need to make money? I would say it's a bit of a cop out, but I would say I, because of the freelance nature of my work, it's, it's fairly flexible. So it dep- it's a question of where I put my focus, I guess. I could, I could maybe accept that I need to work a little bit less on my freelance stuff and put some more time in on this but that's in which case that would mean i need to make money on it quickly uh, in order to kind of make that a reasonable trade off i think that i i guess as well it would be nice just to be able to make more cash as well cuz my my day job is fairly <laughs> low paid so you know that would be nice for my broader kind of like overly ambitious life goals so that would be nice too um so yeah, I would say short to medium term I'm looking at here. And I think that's why I went with the courses option as well. You know, it kind of, it, I knew I had the skill set there already um, and the contacts. So I thought that is a way I can bring in some money from this and justify my time on it straight away. And also, you know, once I've got that secured, then I can use that to develop materials that I might be able to use elsewhere as well. 
Yes, and by running that course, you'll develop materials as you do it. You're developing the course. There's all sorts of things you can build that can go on the blog as you do it. Yeah. Um, and this is the bit, actually. Quite often people go, well, okay, I've sold a few things. I still don't know quite where I should go. You've had an immediate yes from your own college, plus four more yeses. <laughs> if that isn't a clear sign... I'm yeah. not entirely sure what is. <laughs> when you say it like that, Alan, it suddenly seems very clear. But um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know those times when people are going, I don't know what to do. And there's like a flashing sign saying, go this way, <laughs> head down this way. And they're like, I really don't know where to go. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. y you've got people who want to pay you to do what you want to do and make the difference you want to make with a group of creative people in colleges. Mm. You've already got it out there. You've taken the hardest step. You've done the first version and you've got paid for it, which is phenomenal. Here's what I would be doing if I were you. I would be going, okay, so I've got this first version going at the college I work in. I'm two weeks into the five-week thing. How am I going to prove that this was a valuable use of the college's resources? Yep. What statistics can I gather? What report can I create? The reason I'm telling you this, Matt, is because it's what I didn't do when I first started Pop-Up. <laughs> so uh, this comes from the opposite advice of what I do. So please do learn from my mistakes. It's what Simon and I repeat the whole time. Learn from our mistakes. You don't have to make the same ones. Then you can go out and make new mistakes. Well, uh, we can I, all learn together. I am trying my best to make new mistakes because I, I, I did take your advice on the survey. So... Even though the course is very small at the moment, I did get everyone who's kind of signed up to it to do a sort of survey right at the start of the very first session. Um, awesome. And then I'm going to get them to do it at the end. Uh, then so, we can see some change. So, so we can see we... whether they feel more comfortable, whether they feel better in control of their finances. Yeah, we can get some actual data to prove whether your course works or not. Yes. Yeah. And that was totally inspired by what you'd said on the podcast, but also from experiencing your own take take control of your finances course, which, you know, so that that survey was really enlightening to me. Um, the idea of kind of talking about people's values as well and kind of gave me a good I didn't you I didn't just rip your survey off, but I did talk about um <laughs> you know, like how their <laughs> happiness and stuff like that and and how their the stress levels and, and I did put in some stuff about money beliefs inspired by your survey. But I also kind of put some stuff in about how it relates to creativity as well and and you know, this idea of that you have to have a trade-off between the two, um, that that it's kind of the enemy of creativity, that it's um yeah, that basically uh, it's not good that you shouldn't talk about it, you know, in creative way, all these sorts of things. And actually, I have to say, just looking at some, you know, a cursory glance of the kind of pre-survey results, they're not as kind of against the idea of talking about finances as I thought they might be. Um, and, and they don't look at money in creative work as being particularly evil or a source of, you know, shame, which is a good place to start. Actually, I think maybe that kind of younger generation is a bit um, more open to that idea and that that kind of idea of being a sellout which is a really tenuous kind of term and it's really hard to define and is really ultimately a personal decision for you know and set of values so that that's quite encouraging too i think so may, maybe there is something in talking to younger people about it as well because they're in a better position as well to kind of set themselves up as they go out to the world um, and not not make some of those clanging mistakes that i did I would completely agree, Matt. The one thing I would say to you is that what we have discovered at Pop-Up, we tend to, the Pop-Up Business School courses tend to get 30-something plus. Mm. And actually, most of our audience at our events is 40s and 50s. And it's people who are wanting to build businesses at a different phase of their life. And I think what you've discovered is something that we've discovered. The kids at college, the young people at college, have not had the painful experiences to have those beliefs developed yet. Yeah. And what tends to happen is they leave college, they get some low paying jobs, they get into some debt, they have some pain, they're in a financial mess. And it's those experiences, that pain that then drives them to change. Mm -hmm. And you've got them before they've had that pain, which is great. They just need to feel it 
<laughs> like pain is one of the most powerful <laughs> motivators out yeah. there. And if you've never had the pain of working for a company, working for a boss you really don't like, you've never had the pain of going in the like Sunday morning dread, the Sunday dread where you're like, I don't want to go to work the next day. If you've never had that pain, you don't understand how good the opposite is. True. And feeling that pain. So I think that's what you found through your survey is they haven't quite had that pain yet. They haven't had those experiences. So yeah, I'm wondering how you can introduce that so they can sense the pain during the course, uh, maybe get them to think about what it could be like to have that pain. Yeah. Oh, I do have a good example. I have, um, it brings to mind something I've used in my my other lecturing work, which is where I, I, I run a module on freelance journalism. And I do, I have been sort of sneaking in some personal finance stuff in, in that for a few years. <laughs> and, um, uh, we have this, um, I, I can't remember the exact source now um, off the top of my head, but it's uh, um, something someone wrote online that's basically like a story of a, a freedom fund, we'll call it. Um, although they don't use that term, they use the uh, ruder term that also begins with the same letter. Um, so yeah, and they have the, it's a post called the story of that. And and it's basically shows someone getting in a situation without a um, emergency fund and then someone getting in the same situation with the emergency fund. And the different is kind of a sliding doors portrayal of that person's life told in a, you know, probably about a thousand words or so. So that that's quite useful, I find, for kind of showing people the pain of that. You know, the individual in the story kind of winds up in a relationship they don't want to be in, but they feel they can't leave. You know, their boss isn't, you know, a good person to be around either. And, you know, so and then they sort of show the alternative, which is, you know, this person has some money in the bank that they've kind of made by, you know, not buying the fancy car or whatever, um, not not getting the the loan as soon as they get uh, their first salary and so on. And they've made those kind of sacrifices but when it comes to the crunch times like they're able to just leave go stay in a fancy hotel for a night you know and uh you know <laughs> make kind of empower themselves with, uh as a result of it um so that's quite good i've shown that to students before and that's usually pretty effective um as a kind of a, a what if scenario and i think the other thing is actually this conversation has come at a very good time because we are looking at um what if the money runs out that's our question for next week um, so we're, we're talking about, you know, what your options are if it does go wrong and you, you do run out of cash and get into debt or whatever, um, how, how you can handle that and, you know, what to do and what not to do in that scenario. Definitely. Definitely. So I can definitely introduce some pain to them at that point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. So in terms of sales, in terms of persuasion, presentations, pitches, all of those things, there is only two ways to motivate people mm. and those are pain and pleasure or the carrot and the stick and i always say to people which do you think is more motivational which do you think is more motivational matt pain or pleasure um well i'm cheating alan because i think you asked this question on the finance course um and i remember you talking about pain Oh, well, it kind of varies for people, I think, doesn't it? Um, depending on their individual motivation, but usually moving away from pain is a bigger motivator than moving towards pleasure. When I'm doing this at Pop Up Business School, if you can imagine you've got an audience of 100 people in front of you and I will pull out a £20 note or a couple of 20s and I'll say, right, I've got a £20 note here. Who wants to win it? And there's not much of a reaction from the audience. Right. Um, there's a few people who go, yeah, I'll have it. But there's not a huge, you can't feel the energy. And then I go, okay, and I'll pick someone in the audience. I put my money away and I pick someone in the audience. Uh, and I look at them and go, okay, imagine I just took 20 pounds from you and I started to run out of the door. <laughs> How hard would you try and get me back? And you can kind of see in their eyes that I wouldn't make it three steps before I got tackled <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> And the difference in the reaction of trying to avoid losing 20 pounds as opposed to gain 20 pounds is huge. And there's some psychological studies that back it up that say a roundabout pain is six times more motivational than pleasure. Wow. So I would actually have to offer you 120 pounds 
to get the same motivation level as stealing £20 from you. And I find that fascinating because in pitching, in persuasion, in influence, people nearly always focus on the pleasure. So if you get this course, your life will be better in these ways. If you do this, if you buy this product, your life will be better in these ways. And they focus on the pleasure. What I think lots of businesses don't do is they don't create or don't uncover the pain enough to help people get motivated. And whether that's you running the course and helping the students see that if they mess this stuff up, it'll have long-term impacts on their life and there's some real pain, or whether it's a pitch to the universities Mm. which I did enjoy the stat you said about you outlined the problem uh, with some helpful independent stats, like 71% of students worry about money at university. That's a little bit of uncovering the pain, which I really like. So when we're pitching, when we're selling any of our products, finding the pain and helping the other people to understand the pain is key to getting people to take action. One caveat, you cannot just rely on pain. You've got to have some pleasure too. (laughs) Otherwise, it's not very motivational. You know, you need a, here's the pain you'll avoid and here's the nice place you're going. That's the killer conversation. That's the killer way to do it. So I would be looking, you're running this course at the college. I would be starting to work on my report and work out how I can structure my report to show Here's the pain that the average student in was in before. Here's what they didn't understand. Here's how they've changed after my five-week course. And here's how I set them on a better path. Mm. And then actually tracking that over the longer term as you go. So maybe you can keep their details and ask them if you can speak to them six months later or a year later. Maybe you can even find out that your cohort of students came out of college less in debt than the other student? Or wouldn't that be incredibly motivational for someone to be interested in sponsoring your course and helping the next generation? That would be amazing. Yeah. I think I think the other big thing as well in terms of the pain side is um is mental health, which is, you know, poor mental health is quite endemic in UK student populations, um, and particularly creative students. Um uh, we we seem to you know face issues around it at the at the colleges quite frequently as a result of I don't I don't know if it's to be honest as a result of uh, the kind of the backgrounds or personal lives of students or you know just the fact that actually in the creative industries in general uh, there's, there's poorer mental health and there are definite links between that and financial worries and things as well that are important to discuss I think. Hugely important, hugely important. And sales is stats and stories. That's what sales is. So if we're selling the next version of this course, we need the statistics to show here's the problem we're fixing, here's how we fix it, here's how it works. And then we need the stories. Here's Jessica that we helped do this. Here's Dave that was in a mess before and Mm. isn't afterwards. And sales is all about the stats and the stories. So if you can capture those stats and stories will help you to take the course to the next level to get it in front of more people and get it out there. And business is is iterative. It is purely iterative. We do version one, we launch it, we get it sold, we get it done. And then we go, okay, how could we make it better? How can we sell it further? How can we earn more money doing it? Mm. And then we sell version two. And version three. And the fact you had an immediate yes and four more, let's talk about this. Like yep. this, let's sell the next course to those other four. Let's keep that going. Where are you on the sales cycle with the other four colleges, Matt? Firstly, I should say I'm not familiar with all the stages of the sales cycle. So <laughs> <laughs> telling you exactly where I am on a cycle where, that I'm not sure the measurements of is going to be tricky, but they're, I'll describe roughly. Um, so They're different for every business. They're different for every business. So yeah, I guess, where are you with them? Well, I would say different different places, basically. You know, everyone's busy at the moment. All like a large percentage of people's education at universities and colleges, higher education has moved online. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of um, buyers to be put out at the moment. So 
I'll caveat that. But yeah, some are basically passed me on with people and are telling me they're going to be in touch to, to you know, finalize dates in the next, you know, few weeks or whatever. Um, so I'd say two of the four have said that. The other two have given me like, yes, this sounds really good. We like to offer to students and then haven't uh, really kind of progressed much beyond that. So I'd say, I'd say pretty far, far along with two of the four and kind of just at the initial or just past the initial yes, kind of the chasing stage, I guess, with the other two. <laughs> the chasing stage. Yeah. I know that stage so well. Um, <laughs> the key with both of those is to have dates in the diary to follow up. Right. And the two that have said yes, we'll get back to you with dates. Don't be polite like I used to be and let it slide. Yeah. It doesn't happen unless you follow up and they will get busy with normal life, other things, these fires you've said about putting out. If we don't chase, if we don't track down, it won't happen. And there's a way to do it politely. There's a way to do it nicely. We can send follow-up emails. They're great. A follow-up phone call is always better. Phone right. calls make stuff happen. But saying, what can I do to help you make this happen? What's left to do? Um, if you tell me the dates, I can take care of the details. Yeah. Like making it as easy as possible for them to say yes. I like that. Yeah. And having it in the diary to follow up because otherwise <laughs> I've done this recently. You send off a proposal, you don't hear anything back. And then you're going, when did I send that? How long has it been? <laughs> Should I follow up now? Should I not? And you get doubt in your mind about whether you should follow up or not. Depending on the size of the proposal and the size of the thing you sent to the other people, giving them a week is plenty. And then following up with an email, a message saying, really interested to know what you think. What's the next step? Can we organize to have a chat? Maybe it's just the assumptive close of, can we organize to speak about this? Are you free next Tuesday or Wednesday? Yeah. I'm, I'm and it's of, always driving to the next version. Sort of chuckling to myself a bit here, Alan, because this is, we were talking about blind spots um, before the podcast. And like, I actually, you know, I teach a, a module on freelance journalism. So it's all about pitching, chasing up editors, keeping track <laughs> of your uh, pitches and making sure you know who you've chased when. Um, and, you know, making sure those times are in there, you know, so you don't miss these. And I'm just thinking, yeah, God, I do this on my freelance, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not doing it on this. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I do, I think, need to maybe be a bit more persistent with with that. Uh, I think one thing I did do that I think was, was a good move was um, I did send a chase on all of them. And what I did was kind of package up some of the promo materials I'd made for the, the course that I'm teaching at the moment. And sort of send Brilliant. them over and say, oh, yeah, here's, uh, just in case you need it, here's some of the uh, the materials that, you know, you just need to add the date and the time or whatever on it. Um, and here's like the the poster or the, or the slide to go online or in presentations and so on as they're teaching. Because that's how they pro promote a lot of the material that goes on at the college. So, yeah, I, I did think a bit about how to make it easier. And I did kind of use that as a, another excuse to kind of follow up on the email. But I think maybe I just need to be a bit blunter and just be like, you know, about when it's actually going to happen. Also, the other thing I've done that I think might help me there is I I kind of iterated the importance of this course start running in the first term because I was like, you know, we need to get yes. students early on in the year before they've blown all their loan. Something like uh, <laughs> it was something like thirty or forty percent of students um, have no loan, have spent all their loan by week five of the term. So seriously, yeah. So I was like, you know, it's important that we run this. Um, as soon as possible, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think important is underselling it. Yeah. If forty percent of students are running out of loan by week five, yeah, I, that I, I is have a to verify that issue. stat. I can't remember if I've got the figure wrong there, but it's a significant percentage anyway. You know, and it's it's I guess it's what's going to happen as well because a lot of these, uh, you know, people have they're leaving home for the first time and they're handed this lump sum at the beginning of of term and told to make it last till after Christmas. Um, and they've never and, had the budget before. Yeah. And, and, you know, certainly when I was at school, we had no personal finance training. I know that is improving a bit now in the UK, but, um, gradually, uh, I think, and certainly the students I've asked about their previous kind of education around personal finance say they've had little to none. So, yeah. 
And also, there is a lot of fun to be had when you first get to college. <laughs> there there is. is a lot of temptation. <laughs> there is a lot of fun. Yeah. And money can be quite useful in enjoying yourself. Indeed. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's about metering out your fun just slightly uh, rather than <laughs> kind of having lots of fun in the first two weeks and then well, no fun for the rest of the there's ways to have fun without blowing all the cash. Indeed. There is ways to have fun with a le- smaller amount of money. Maybe that's the first bit. How mm. to have more fun with less debt. Yeah, yeah. And I think... <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's a, you know, I have been sort of talking to them a lot about how to basically think, make yourself happiest with the money that you do spend um, and how we should think about prioritizing those kind of things. What kind of things make you happiest when you spend money? So yeah, there's, there's lots that we can do there on the carrot side. I think interesting to think more about the pain, the, the stick and the pain as well. I guess I could relate that to how they kind of use that money as well across that time. Definitely. And then possibly finding some examples of students who haven't cared for their money and what mess they've ended up in. So if you can find actual examples of real students and do a case study that like, here's someone that was in your situation three years ago. Now look where they are. That will paint out the road and the choices for them. So Matt, you said your biggest challenge was time and focus. How do you feel about that now? I feel, yeah, I've definitely... I feel, yeah, it's, that is something I can manage. I think, you know, essentially what we're saying there is I've done a lot of the work already. Uh, I've done a lot of the time consuming stuff in developing the first iteration of the course and those first few sales. So I think that really, that does help me kind of narrow it down as well as, you know, this is a successful part of the business. This is working. This is the business really, isn't it? And I think in terms of my overall mission and how it relates to that, my concern is that I am not reaching the people, not everyone that I'd like to reach, you know, I I would like to be able to talk to professionals, you know, people who are working in the creative industries. And and I've done a bit of that via my own kind of network, just in terms of like helping on sort of one-to-one basis, kind of giving some people, friends and family really in the creative industries, a bit of guidance over what to do. And I've really found that, that rewarding as well. So I would like to be able to develop that, but I, I don't know if I'm kind of jumping the gun. Because, you know, I have this thing that's working with the students. I have experience teaching this age group, qualifications too. And so maybe I should just be focusing on that and maybe trying to spread that beyond these first few places. Three thoughts for you, Matt. Yeah. Number one, you said, I haven't reached everyone yet. (laughs) Yeah. You can probably tell what I'm going to say next, (laughs) don't you? Yeah. Um, You can't reach everyone all at once. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> you've only just started yeah. you're helping people you're making a difference you're getting out there and if only i was speaking to myself 12 years ago be patient one step at a time focus yeah. on making it as good as you can and do the work and you will get there you just need to do it one step at a time focus on what you're currently doing rather than trying to skip to the end where you've influenced the world Um, You've got to start with the 20 students, however many students you've got in a room, make that work. That will get you then 300 students across four colleges. That will then get you further and further. So let's make this first one as good as we can Mm -hmm. and focus on closing the next one. So if only I had someone saying that to me at the start, I would have loved it. So please hear from experience. You haven't reached everyone yet. That's because you've just started. It's okay relax <laughs> let's just follow the path it's gonna be okay um good to hear thank you the second thing which actually follows on nicely is split focus equals split results mm. fuzzy focus equals fuzzy results so if you've got four ideas and you're doing a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you're doing all these different things you'll get a little bit of results in each area yeah If you have laser-like focus on this course, making it the best you can, producing the results, pushing the next ones over the line, laser-like focus, you will make so much progress on this. You will create evangelists who really love what you do, that talk about your words. Like It makes such a difference. And it's that focus that will get you where you want to get to. So please have in mind split focus equals split results. And then the final thought is 
quite often people, and this comes from me again, it feels like it's a therapy session for me where I get to talk about everything (laughs) I did wrong in the past. People just don't quite push it over the line. They do the course, but they don't quite push the report over the line and don't quite follow up with the person who booked the course. Mm. And they don't go back to them and sit down and go, here's everything we did and here's how it worked and what were your thoughts and what could we do better? And they don't quite do all the steps afterwards. And the critical bit is you, you've got the first yes. Someone <laughs> said yes, Matt. You're running it. You've got it. Yeah, We've got to smash that thing home. We've got to push it over the line. We've got to drive all the way through, get the results, get the feedback, do the report, send it. And it's a little more work, but that's how you get the juice out of that first opportunity and turn it into something bigger in the future. That's uh, all ringing worryingly true with me, Alan. So thanks. Um, (laughs) The split focus, split results as well is just how I live my life because, you know, almost by nature as a freelancer, you're, you're just like, that's just how you work. You know, it's like, oh, I need to do that and that and that and that, you know, because I've, you know, I write for, you know, good handful of publications in any one month, you know, different contacts, different ideas that I have to pitch to get those opportunities. Um, and I think I may be porting some of that into this project, this business that in an unhelpful way. So yeah, focus split focus split results is gonna that's burned itself into my brain already so um thank you (laughs) (laughs) and to everyone listening to the podcast it's very difficult to do multiple projects when you're first starting out Mm. a little bit later on and sometimes people use my own advice against me and say alan you know split focus equals split results it's slightly different Now, Pop-Up Business School, there's a team of eight people that run it. There's me, my business partner. We've got a whole team. It's okay when you've got a bigger team to have a little bit of split focus because the individuals don't have split focus and you're pressing on. But even then, even with a business the size of Pop-Up Business School, I still keep repeating, we need to focus on the events. We need to focus on the thing that generates the revenue. We need to focus on the one thing that pushes us forwards that's what we need to focus on. So even later on, it still rings true. It does change a little bit as you get going. But to start with, definitely first few years, split focus equals split results. And well, yeah, (laughs) even when you start to get a team, it's still true. To ask a question that potentially exposes me to more ridicule because of, uh, well, I know it's not ridicule, but personal ridicule. Um, mild abuse. Mild uh, we'll abuse. just go for mild abuse. Mild abuse yeah. I'm fine with, yeah. Um, I do a lot with the site at the moment. It takes up a huge amount of time. Um, and, you know, and p- perhaps the most part of my time, even though the site itself has not, you know, is not earning uh, or pr- producing an income. So I, I think it's been really valuable doing it. And I think it, being able to say to them, you know, uh, you know, this is why I'm the right person to deliver this course. I've set up this website, you know, and, you know, I've been writing about this stuff. And I think, I think that's been really valuable, um, in sort of supporting my pitch, but in terms of the split focus, you know, I do a newsletter once a week for the site, which takes up a lot of time. It has a lot of like a roundup of funding opportunities and stuff, for the creative industries, as well as, you know, resources about creative, the kind of creative money crossover. And then obviously the website itself uh, creativemoney.co.uk. I realize I've not even said the URL yet, so that's poor marketing. Um, (laughs) Matt Parker, (laughs) creativemoney.co.uk. Visit the site now. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so obviously the site itself, I try and put one post or interview or, you know, guide up there a week, once a week, and then run the social media and it's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, it's really a beast of a a project in that respect. And then at the same time, I'm developing this course and I'm probably managing, I'm trying to do all that within, you know, a day, a week. And what is actually happening is, you know, it's probably if I really did the actual time calculation on of it, it, it's probably much more like two days once I factor in, you know, early mornings or late, late nights and so on. So yeah, what, how, if I, with the split focus, split results being the mantra, you know, how do I decide what to keep or lose from that? So my immediate question is, a weekly email 
is a huge amount. What are your open rates on the newsletter each week? And um, would you get higher open rates by emailing less often? Or are they reading the weekly email consistently? Well, I don't have much to compare against. I know I'm getting something like 30 to 40% opens on. It's a small group at the moment as well. It's only about, you know, less than 100, I think, on, on the mailing list at the moment. Um, but it's growing cool. and I've done some guest posts and stuff for some of the sites I write for regularly, you know, at, of kind of agreed or reduced rate in order that I post that I can bung a bunch of links into the site, basically. Um, <laughs> so, and they've been very uh, yeah, friendly and sort of accommodating in that. So that's starting to build things a little bit more now. I'm starting to see a bit more kind of traction from that side. But yeah, it's so that I'd say an open rate, I think it's around 35 percent, somewhere around that. So I'd be thinking, let's do a test. Let's email them the next week and say, I'm going to reduce this to once every two weeks, once every three weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have, I'm going to make sure it's impactful content that you need to open and need to read. Because at the moment, you're putting a huge amount of effort into supporting the online group, which is great, but it's not getting you where you want to get to. And I would just... Me personally, if I were you, I would build that slower and maybe do an article once every three weeks and a newsletter once every three weeks or once every two weeks and spend more time focused on the course because that's where I think the cash is going to come from in the short term. Yes. And that's also going to build you the credibility to do stuff on the site as well. Yeah, that's yeah, it's I think. If I think about it, I have been waiting for someone to tell me to do less on the website <laughs> or that it's okay to do less because, you know, I started this thing. I'm really passionate about it. I remain really passionate about it. But, uh, you know, it's quite an imposition on my week and it's not the side of it that's making the money at the moment. So you yeah. have my permission, Matt, to focus on what makes cash. Thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's really helpful. Um <laughs> Yeah, Not I can, I'm it, looking forward already. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I yeah, no, I, I. The thing is, I think I do operate like that sometimes. I sometimes need someone else to go, "Hey, stop!" <laughs> like what he did. My wife's always, you know, I laughed as well on behalf of my wife when you said split focus, split results, because she's always like, <laughs> you know, "You're so busy, stop think, think about this thing." You know. Uh, so yeah, um, I feel like that might be the title of your next blog article. <laughs> for your audience <laughs> about finances true like you can write to them split focus on your finances equals split results yeah uh, it's yeah. definitely that that's true, ties true. true on everything in life cool absolutely this has flown by closing thought from you what i'd love to ask is you've got off the sidelines you've got your first product out there you've sold it if you had words for the audience of the rebel entrepreneur about launching a business, getting going, getting off the sidelines, getting the first product out there. Mm. What would you say to them? I would say go for it um, because I was surprised at the, uh, I mean, I, I went into this primed for a lot of rejection. And as I think I said in one of my emails to you, you know, I'm, I'm still primed for a lot of rejection. I still don't think I'm going to go through this without experiencing that. But I was surprised at how, when I put together a thoughtful pitch and kind of had identified a problem, had identified maybe, you know, what the solution, the benefits of the product were, I was surprised at how kind of up for it and into the idea everyone was um, and how quickly they kind of came back with a positive answer when I actually asked for a sale. Um, so that, that's that been hugely encouraging. And then the other thing I would say is I, I think some of the advice from the podcast that really helped me was the kind of the, the done is better than perfect approach. I really like, I mean, I still put a lot of work into the, des the d design of the site and getting it off the ground and all of that way too much really. And I still am to some extent, so I could still take a bit more of that uh, advice myself, but I think just get something out there. You don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I've, more recently, I've just, this principle has been going over in my head that kind of, I think when you say you want it perfect, what you're asking for is certainty. And you're just not going to get that. And and really only operating in certainty is just is just another form of cowardice, really. It's just saying, you know, I need to know that this is going to be a success before I try it. And you can't know that. You have to just try it. So that's 
that's probably the most important lesson for me. I love that. Thank you, Matt. And to everyone listening, done is better than perfect. Get out there. And what we all love to say to you is pick one idea, do a mini experiment without debt, launch it, sell it, get it out there. And let's see if we can build you a business doing something you love. Matt, you've been brilliant. Uh, One last time, where can people find your website and more about what you're doing? So the website is creativemoney.co.uk. So you can go there and I guess the best thing people can do if they want to kind of help out the site and support what we're doing is just sign up to the mailing list for now because I will be emailing every two to three weeks in the near future. (laughs) uh, But yeah, I should be updating everyone with what's going on with the site and other projects and so on within that too. So yeah, I'd really love to kind of welcome anyone that's got an interest in the subject to the site and the mailing list and kind of build that community. Excellent. The Rebel Finance School is back. I'm so excited. (laughs) My wife, Katie, and I are here. We are bringing back the Rebel Finance School for this year's version, RFS 2022. And we will be running for 10 weeks helping people to get control of their finances. Can't wait. It starts on Monday, 23rd of May, uh, runs for 10 weeks. It's completely free. It'll be online, runs every Monday for 10 weeks. And we're excited to help people figure out how much money they have, how much money they spend, how to talk to people in their lives about finances and how to look after the money that they have and how to build wealth and start to invest. Can you answer these questions? How much am I spending each year? What is my annual spend? How much am I saving? What is my percentage savings rate? When can I retire and will I have enough money to live? What is the investment strategy for retirement? What's my net worth? Like, Can you confidently answer these questions? If not, then you've got to come along. All you need to do is go to rebelfinanceschool.com, sign up, and Katie and I are giving away our 10-week course. This is our way of giving back after we've reached financial independence. Yes, we've seen that the way that people can get in a bit of a pickle with money, we want people to avoid that pain, and it's our way of giving back and helping people with their money. So please tell your friends, your grandmum, your babies, everyone. Rebel Finance School is back. You can find it on the Rebel Business School social media and share it there. Or you can find me on social media and share it there. Just please tell people about this. We want to make a genuine difference in people's finances with the cost of living crisis, with high inflation. Now is the time to help people take control of their finances at Rebel Business School. Let's do this, Alan. Sign up, rebelfinanceschool.com. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.